Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our live broadcast. So the, the Buddha's teaching is if you've spent any time looking into it, it's quite a vast ocean of teachings and histories and stories and there's a lot there. It can make it somewhat daunting to try and understand even the simple aspects of how to practice meditation. So there are different ways of dealing with this, of, of approaching the Buddha's teaching when, when explaining, when teaching. One of them is, and we see this in the Buddha's teaching, one of the ways is to pick one quality and talk about it at great length. So this is we zoom in on a teaching. And uh, they're called suttas, and, and it's a good word, whether or not it's what it originally meant, but sutta means a thread. So the idea is that you can start from one point and you can connect it to the rest, to the whole. There are many ways of looking at Buddhism, uh, looking at the Buddha's teaching. And uh, there, there are many ways of, of approaching the same concept or the same idea, the same core. Another way of going about it, something that I'd like to look at today, is the idea of giving an overview of the Buddha's teaching. And uh, as with finding a single thread, there are, there are also many ways of looking at the entire tapestry of the Buddha's teaching. So there are many summaries, many ways of summarizing the Buddha's teaching. But I think one of the most m macroscopic or, or all-encompassing is um, what the Buddha called the Bodhipakya Dhamma. Bodhi meaning enlightenment, bhakya, having a, having a part. Bodhibhagya, maybe, bhakya, I guess. Uh, having a part in, in enlightenment. Why I think this is, this is one of the most all encompassing is because there's 37 of them. So it's a list of lists, lists actually. It's a group of lists. In total, enumerating 37 dhammas, 37 aspects of the Buddha's teaching. I don't want to go into detail with these, but with each of them, but hopefully give a bit of an overview because they're all very much related to meditation. So it gives us a good idea of the sorts of things that we're cultivating. And the best way to look at this is not to think, wow, I have to study 37 individual teachings and that that's how I get a complete understanding of, of the pra uh, practice that leads to enlightenment, but rather to understand that when we practice mindfulness, when we practice the four satipatthana, there's a lot more that comes along with it. There's a lot of great things that come along with it. Sort of help give us an idea of what it's like to practice mindfulness or what it should be like, what should be involved, so we can have some encouragement that we're practicing properly. So the first four of these are the four satipatthana. These are the, the basis of the meditation practice. 
and these ones are obvious. This is where, if you're not incorporating these four into your practice, well, it's hard to say that you're actually practicing to become enlightened. So it has to start here. These are the ones that it should be easy to understand how this relates to our practice. We have the body. So when we watch, we watch the movements of the body or the breath as it relates to the body. And the stomach rising and falling, for example. The mindfulness of the body. When we watch the feelings and we're mindful, or we remind ourselves this is feeling. Vedana, suvedana, nupasi, viharati. This is pain, this is pleasure, this is calm. The reminding ourselves this is the basis of the practice because it puts us in a position to be able to see things objectively, without judgment. It reminds us, it's not me, it's not mine, it's not good, it's not bad. And it focuses our attention on objective reality. Kaya Vedana Jitta, the mind, focusing on the mind, and Dhammas, when we focus on the hindrances, or the senses, or the aggregates. This is all under the four foundations of mindfulness. So this is the basis. This one is clear how this is in our practice. Should be clear. If it's not, well, this is where you have to start your learning. The second one is called the Samabhadhana, the, the four right exertions. It's another, another one of the Buddha's teachings and it also partakes of enlightenment or has a place apart. But what that means is that when you practice while well, you're cultivating these four as well, it's, we should be encouraged that we're not just being mindful, we also have right effort. We're exerting ourselves properly. Why? How? How do we know this? The right effort is, in, is, in, is it's not just about pushing yourself hard or, or working harder and harder at something. It's about being meticulous and cultivating wholesomeness and maintaining wholesomeness. The four samapatana, the effort to uh, guard against unwholesomeness, and to eradicate it when it's arisen. And the effort to cultivate wholesomeness and to protect it once it's arisen. So it's very much about practicing mindfulness. As I was saying, the objectivity that comes, well, that's the goodness. And the judgment, the partiality, the aversion and, and addiction, these are the bad that we try to do away with. So simply by being mindful, you have already right exertion. You're doing the right work. You're working in the right direction. The third is the third is the idibada. This is the third set. And there's four of these as well. So we're up to twelve. The idibada are, are perhaps a little more prescriptive in the sense that they'll make and break your practice possible to practice without them, but it's not possible to succeed without them. So this is a measure of our success. If you're wondering how to succeed in practicing mindfulness, well, listen up. The idipada are what you need. The first one is chanda. You need to you need to like what you're doing. Not exactly like, but you need to be content with it. Chanda is this um, sort of catch-all phrase that can refer to desire, but it means that you're um, excited or energetic about what you're doing. There's something that's pushing you to do it. If you have no interest in mindfulness, well, how can you possibly succeed, right? If it's something that, and this is what we see, you know, when you try to push mindfulness on others or when people bring their children to come and practice or their husbands and wives try to drag their friends into practicing, you can see, well, it's very low success rate. And most of the time, there's no chanda involved. There's no interest in it. Interest isn't something you can give to someone else. It's something that must be cultivated. So you have to ask yourself, 
What is worth being interested in? Is mindfulness worth being interested in? Am I interested in it? If you're not interested in mindfulness, well, that's quite a scary thing. Maybe it's time that you start evaluating uh, your focus in life. What is it that you're interested in? Why aren't you interested in mindfulness? Second one is effort. Well, this just goes back to the second set. You need to put out effort. You need to work at it. Uh, the third one is citta. Citta means you have to keep it in mind. You have to keep your mind on, on, on the practice. If you're interested in it but you never pay attention, you never actually uh, actually put your mind to it, you know, that you won't succeed. And the fourth is vimangsa, which is sort of this mm, discrimination where you, you evaluate your practice. This is the ability to step back and correct your practice. So citta means pushing ahead. Um, but dhamma, dhamma means, uh, sorry, citta means pushing ahead, but uh, vimangsa um, means adjusting. You know, not just pushing ahead all the time, but pushing ahead and then uh, realizing you're off course, going in the other direction. So seeing what you're doing wrong. The ability to see the things that you're missing, the ability to evaluate. Wait a second, I'm not really being mindful here. In order to succeed, you need these four. But these come up in the practice, and they're the challenge that a meditator faces, cultivating all four of these. This is how you wrestle with the practice until you progress to succeed. The fourth and fifth set are the uh, indriya and the bala, and it's the same but but different, uh, different way of looking at the same five things. So we have sadha, vidya, sati, samadhi, panya. Sadha means confidence. You need confidence. Uh, vidya is effort. Sati is mindfulness. Samadhi is concentration. And panya is wisdom. And so here again, here you start to say, oh, oh, there's a lot of things to keep in mind, but it's not really like that. The point is that when you practice again, these five come up. I've talked about this extensively, that you shouldn't try to cultivate any one of these besides mindfulness. Mindfulness is the balancing one. When you're being mindful, there's confidence. You're confident because you can see this is this. Perfect, the most perfect confidence because you're actually knowing something. There's no belief involved, there's no logic or argumentation involved. This is this. When seeing is seeing, you can't argue with that. So you have confidence. Uh, and also that you see the way you know, seeing works and hearing works and how the mind interacts with the body. And there's perfect confidence because you're seeing it, you're knowing it. Effort comes because just by being mindful there's right effort already. We've talked about that. Um, so then mindfulness, concentration well, as well, you're focused. When you say to yourself, rising, falling, or seeing, or hearing the mantra, the repetition and the reminding of yourself keeps you focused. And five, wisdom. Wisdom is the understanding that comes from being mindful. Because when you look, you see. When you see, you know. If you want to know, you have to look. If you have to see, if you want to see, you have to look. Look, see, know. This is the progression, the order of progression. But you can't look and not see, and you can't see and not know. It's uh, sufficient, sufficient to see and sufficient to look. So you don't have to go looking. Uh, is this true? Is that too? Where is impermanence? Where is suffering? If you look, you'll see it. So these are the indriya. We all have these faculties. Bala um, refers to the power. So the Buddha separated these out. In, when we talked about indriya, he would talk about the di people's different levels of, of these things and how they can be, even become imbalanced. But bala means uh, the power. These are when they are well balanced. So he would talk about these when he talked about the qualities of, a, of a, a, an enlightened being or a, a powerful meditator. 
they have these five powers They're based on the faculties it's the same five so we add another ten and we get twenty two the next set is called the bojangas bojangas and this is another another use of the word bodhi bodhi anga or boja anga boja meaning it's the same as the word Buddha, it means to wake up or to become enlightened or to know something, to come to know. So Anga means uh, just the factors, or Anga actually means like a finger, well, no, Anga just means factor, member. So the Bojangas are the factors of enlightenment, a smaller list than the 37, but another useful one as well. As you can see, all, all of these are, are ways of talking about the Buddhist teaching. But they all come together as one. So the seven bojangas are again sati. And then we have uh, viriya, the sati, and then dhamavichaya, viriya, uh, piti, pasadi, samadhi, and upeka. So sati starts with sati is mindfulness. The factors of enlightenment start with mindfulness. And then you have Dhamma, Vichaya, Viri, and Piti. These three are the effort-based ones. Dhamma, Vichaya means the investigation or the, the learning or the, the seeing that comes from being mindful. Viriya is the effort, the energetic nature of being mindful. And Piti is, is the sort of excitement or the energy, the, the static charge that comes from the rapture or the um, groove, getting into a groove sort of as piti, building up the power. And then you have basadi, which means tranquility, samadhi, which is concentration again, and upeka, which is equanimity. So the, the second, third, and fourth, these are effort-based. The fifth, sixth, and seventh, these are tranquility-based. And, and effort and tranquility have to balance. If you're, this is what this is where the Buddha, one place where the Buddha actually said you could adjust and you should cultivate the the former three if uh, if you're feeling drowsy or, or lazy, and you should uh, cultivate the last three. Uh, if you're feeling distracted or restless. But then he says, you know, mindfulness. Is, mindfulness is what is always useful. Satinsha kohang bhikave sabbati kang vadami. Mindfulness is the one that you use. And when you use it, well, the, the, the rest do balance out just by being mindful. You can, you can adjust them. And the Buddha does leave room for that. He says, you know, focus on on investigation and effort and rapture if you're feeling drowsy and focus on the uh, tranquility, concentration and equanimity if you're feeling uh, restless but we don't really need to go that far you know, many times the Buddha would just talk about mindfulness it's good to know and it's good to see when you're Again, using vimangsa to see which one is, is in excess or in, in deficiency. Yeah, so you can apply mindfulness properly. Ultimately, what we're looking for is this last one, upeka. Upeka, in, in terms of mindfulness or practice of mindfulness, it means seeing things objectively without any judgment. Seeing everything that arises simply as it is. When you stop reacting to your experiences, that's the highest state of insight meditation. It's this, the, the peak, the pinnacle, it's what we have to get to in order to become enlightened. Anyway, these seven are very much present in our practice. So there we go, we've added another seven qualities. The final eight is the, the Eightfold Noble Path. Um, so this one is, should be a, very familiar to everybody. How this appears in your practice, it can often confound people. There's eight, you know, it's the most so far, it's a lot. 
And so you think, well, you have to study a lot and learn about all eight of these. But again, it's not really like that in a practical sense. They really do come together. And the easiest way to understand how they come together is to, to um, condense them down to the three trainings. The Eightfold Noble Path in its base is really only three things. We have uh, morality or uh, behavior. We have concentration and wisdom. Morality, concentration, and wisdom. These are the basis of the Eightfold Noble Path. And you boil it down, that's what the Eightfold Noble Path talks about. And that's useful because in a practical sense you don't see, oh, here's right, right, right view, here's right thought, and so on. It's, it's not quite so clear. In practice they sort of do all come together. It's very difficult to pick them out. Certainly you don't see right action and right livelihood and right effort and right speech and right mindfulness, right concentration. Picking them apart is possible, but not, not so useful. So morality is the, the body and speech involved with meditation, which it's right because it's not there. You know, you're not speaking, you're not acting. And moreover, your mind is um, not misbehaving. It's not creating uh, unethical acts of body or, or, or speech. And here by unethical, we really in an ultimate sense mean based on defilement. So when you walk quickly or when you wander around uh, confused, those are all expressions of, a, of a, an unethical mind. They're considered to be unethical actions. When you make a fist, that's unethical. When you like in, out of anger, when you sh when you tense up out of fear, that's unethical. These are all unethical, meaning they they're unethical, meaning they cause you suffering. That's all it means. And so, as you practice mindfulness, you become ethical. There's no more eating unmindfully. There's no more. Uh, Speaking unmindfully, drinking, walking, standing, sitting and lying are all done mindfully. So all of our actions, and when we speak, we speak mindfully. All of this is from, uh, from the practice becoming ethical. Concentration, of course, well, that should be fairly obvious. If we've already talked about it. You become concentrated. But you become concentrated on, uh, on reality, which allows for wisdom to arise. The third one. Wisdom being right view and right thought. So our thoughts are right and our view is right. We have right view because we see things as they are. So the idea here is to give an overview and to help us to see that wow, there's a lot involved. And get some I think some encouragement as to the greatness of the Buddhist teaching. It really did cover a lot. The Buddha really did go in depth. He didn't just give us be mindful and and, and uh, we have to go on faith that that's somehow the right path. No, he was quite detailed. Look, when you're mindful, there's at least 37 things. There's, there's a lot of different things that are involved here. A lot of good that comes from it. And it's quite complete in terms of talking about the various aspects of the mind, various aspects of experience. Also can give us some, you know, it's good to go in detail like this because it maybe reminds us of some qualities of mind that we were uh, ignoring or, or dismissing, that we're overlooking. So it helps us look over our practice and to see maybe what what we're lacking and, and to adjust our practice accordingly by being mindful of things, simply by being mindful of things that we weren't being so mindful of. So there you go. A short exposition on the 37 states that partake of enlightenment. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning